to forget to do that. <clears throat> and I'm going to spotlight. Da, 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 da. Oh, and wow. Now I'm <laughs> big. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How are we doing? Good. Awesome. Um, so I'm Derek Smith. I'm from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, I have been teaching the uh, summer symposium for 20 two or 23 years, something like that, um, with Susie. And I'm the director of Interplay Winter Guard from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I've also worked with many marching bands and uh, color guards throughout the state. I'm also a judge for color guard and marching band. <clears throat> and uh, my real job, I am a uh, chemistry teacher for high school. So it's been a crazy spring for all that kind of stuff. But um, so um, I... I am excited to actually be able to talk to some people besides my dog and my mother and my husband and just kind of talk uh, Winter Garden. Of, of course, you know, things are a little bit uncertain right now with what could happen when, in the fall season, the winter season. But, you know, we're just going to, you know, trudge along and hoping that we'll be able to uh, be able to be performing with each other again sometime soon. So the roundtable is very much for... Uh, you and your questions and quite often we'll get started on talking <clears throat> about something and it leads to other discussions and this hour will be over before you know it so um, I'd like to start uh, just by asking if there are any specific questions that you have that you want to address so it kind of helps to guide our discussion for the time that we're together and I'm going to be you know taking notes over here on your questions so if there's anything that we don't get to I want to make sure that I can follow up uh, with some uh, answers after the fact. Great. And Derek, what we usually have done is use the chat feature. I mean, people are welcome to unmute themselves and talk, but sometimes that leads to us talking on top of each other. So is that okay with you if they type their questions in the chat box? Totally. Great. I sent you an email today. Did you, do you know if you got it? I did get it. Okay. And now I took myself off my screen. How did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I can't need... see myself anymore. Oh no. Did you hit grid view? Oh, there I am. Gallery? Oh, okay. Hi. I don't look any better than I did before. Darn it. <laughs> so but yeah, if we, if we use the chat feature, um, I have a question that uh, came in earlier today, which was um, someone who was at our camp a few years ago she has uh, a color guard of her own, started with three, and has now um, tripled that up to nine, which is pretty awesome. It's a relatively small school. And she wants to get into doing winter guard now. And her question today was, you know, I've got the kids, I've got the rehearsal facilities lined up, and wh what do I do? You know, where do I start? So... <clears throat> I mean, that's a, that's a really loaded question for where, you know, how you get, how you get started, but having kids and having rehearsal space is a big, a big part of it. Um, my recommendation to uh, that is, first of all, you want to get in touch with uh, your local uh, color guard circuit, your local winter guard circuit, and they're pretty, most circuits now have a website and pretty easy to find or a Facebook group or whatever. And get a hold of somebody even under the contact us or get a administrator of the Facebook group or whatever it is and just say, Hey, I'm new. I'm just getting started with my color guard this winter and um, looking to find out what I have to do to register, what I have to do to get into shows, how many shows are required, all that kind of stuff. What are the fees going to be and uh, start planning from there. And quite often uh, I know our circuit does. I'm, sure many other circuits do as well. We have people who have been around the circuit for quite a long time who are mentor directors uh, for anyone who comes in new. And those people are awesome to get in contact with because they've kind of been through it several times, right? And then they can help, um, help you with that process of where do I register? Who do I register with? How much is it going to cost? And, uh, kind of give you the lay of the land of the circuit because every circuit's a little bit different uh, with how they function and how they, um, what they require. So that's kind of the logistical part of it. And, and there are so many resources usually out there for 
what do I need to do step by step to get going within a, a new circuit? In terms of the actual group and how it's going to function, I kind of feel like it's important to get together with your team at that, you know, maybe not, doesn't have to be the first rehearsal, but within the first couple of rehearsals and, uh, you know, you might have some new kids, so you want to kind of get them a little bit comfortable with each other first, but I definitely recommend starting off with setting goals for your team. And that is uh, making the goals for you. You should write down some goals, have them write down goals for the team, and then also personal goals for themselves. And that's a really great way to start your season uh, with, a, with a straightforward focus of here's what we want to accomplish this year. And the first year going out, you're you know, probably not going to have a goal of we're going to go out and win WGI world class. And maybe you do, and that's great. Um, but keep it, keep them, uh, you, you, they can sometimes use a little little direction like, hey, we want to make sure that we work really well together as a team this year. We want to make sure we're supportive of uh, our teammates. We, I, and then individual goals. I want to be great at uh, a rifle triple by the end of December, um, those kind of things. So <clears throat> I would, it's a, totally okay to have competitive goals. This is a competitive activity and, um, so you, you can't ignore that, but you want to kind of keep that in focus where, you know, keeping kids from saying, you know, I want to win. Well, of course, everyone wants to win. But if this activity was all about winning, there would be nine happy groups at WGI every year and everybody else would be disappointed. Right. So um, keeping in mind that com being competitive is OK, just more on the edge of, hey, we want to work really hard to achieve the highest success that we can. And if we do our very best to do that and keep focused and work hard and be committed, then everything else takes care of itself. You know, things are out of your hands once judges start making tapes and putting down numbers and things like that. So kind of keeping um, from the very start, uh, uh, not a lid on, but just kind of a, a packaging correctly of those competitive types of goals. Um, <clears throat> In terms of I'm trying to just cover a lot here, I know there's some other questions coming in here and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with this real quick. Um, I would also just recommend not going too hard, too much right at the beginning. You, wanna, you want this to build and build success for your members so that they, you, they can achieve eventually what you give them. We're not going to start our first winter guard throwing, you know, six triple turnaround catching the splits behind your back. Uh, because it's not probably for most of us going to be achievable and it's not going to help them build success, which is the, you know, and build their confidence. So don't feel like you have to do all these twirls all at once. And, and that's hard to do sometimes because kids are like, Oh, we saw this cool trick on YouTube and we want to put it in our show. And, um, you know, this might be some trick that was done by some world-class team and you're entering regional a class for your first year. It's not, number one, it's not appropriate for that class. And you'll be probably told that at uh, your first performance, but uh, also it's not going to allow them to achieve even competitive success probably really well because those lower classes, especially it is a hundred percent about excellence. Yes, you have to have content, but you want to make sure that in the end, we maybe write the show a little bit above where the students are so that they can rise to it and then really have a lot of time during the season to perform, uh, kind of be able to really uh, work on their confidence and their performance, not worrying about if they're going to catch that, you know, cartwheel under a 20 kind of thing. So that's uh, kind of my quick uh, getting started kind of ideas on that. And looking in the chat here, um, Sarah, how are you, Sarah? Um, when starting, do you suggest doing a school only or open? Um, can you unmute yourself, Sarah, and explain that question a little bit more for me, please? Yeah, so like, is it easier to get, do you think it would be easier? Cause like we, I come from a small school um, yep. So we have like six, but I know out of those six, I'm going to lose from my fall program because they do cheerleading at the same time. So our competitions would be on the same day. So 
would it be better being from a small school to try and do just a school I guess it's called scholastic I don't it's been a long time since I've been in Winter Garden okay <laughs> I did crescendo that tells you how long ago it's been yeah yeah I was in 4k <laughs> yes so we did the Avita show um but when or would it be better to try and pull from the surrounding communities? I got gotcha. you. Okay. okay. So rather staying scholastic is all from one school or being independent from other schools. Um, I'm going to say that it, it really kind of depends on your situation. If you, if you are at a small school, this might be a great opportunity and it, because you're talking about it competing with cheerleading or whatever. Um, at, uh, I've worked with Jenison the past few years as well, and um, they started to, we started to really recruit actively from the marching band. And the marching band kids, and Jenison is a pretty busy, competitive, rehearsed a lot marching band. Those kids were looking for something to do in the winter as well. So getting, uh, pulling in from band kids um, into the winter guard they're great to teach because they understand already counting and tempo and music and moving their feet in time and that kind of thing that's a great thing to try to get some new blood into the program in the off season when you have some other competitive um uh, some other competitive things that are pulling people out uh you can also look at um recruiting from um we will get our our kids dressed up you know put on a cute dress, do some hair and makeup, and send them to other classes, send them to uh, orchestra, send them to art classes, um, those kind of things. The, uh, they often will be some of similar populations that you might get one or two more kids. And, you know, if you can get two to five more kids from outside of the actual color guard itself, it's going to help to build the program and then maybe one of them or two of them will end up doing marching band instead in the fall because they really liked it. If you don't feel like you have that pull, what I would do is just reach out to local directors of um, uh, some other schools around where you're from and see if they would be interested in kind of doing a collaboration as an independent unit. I will tell you, having been independent with Interplay for 25 years, you're, you're going to have potentially some challenges with rehearsal facilities and things like that that are not as difficult to overcome when you're from you know you can say hey all these kids are from our school as opposed to hey I've got kids from seven different schools who we want to bring to our gym um, now if you have other color guard directors that are kind of and band directors who are supportive of that sometimes you might be able to get several schools pulled together for an independent unit and you can primarily rehearse in one place and if that's the case, then, then great. Um, so I, it really kind of depends on your, your situation. And hopefully that gives you some ideas of how you could go one way or the other. All right. Um, let's see. Next up, we've got uh, Jalen. Hi, Jalen. Uh, can you tell us about your process when it comes to creating and staging your shows? Uh, well, I will tell you, it, that is also kind of an individual uh, piece, to be sure. Um, what I would say, though, in general, <clears throat> is that, I mean, everyone kind of has a different process. I, if, if it's for me, I normally start with the music, because that's just the thing that kind of makes it happen for me. Um, and what I can really uh, relate to. And I kind of go with my ideas from there. It's always been, it's, it's been more challenging for me to start with an idea and then try to find a piece of music that fits it. Certainly that, that works uh, as well. And I think that's, that's sometimes how um, people, many people proceed. I usually start with the music and go from there. And when you're thinking about music, <clears throat> uh, and depending on the level that you're working with, um, if you're in a, a regional A or an A class, even open class, um, well, heck, even world class, if you can find something that has a, a, a tempo that is pretty consistent, sometimes we hear these beautiful ballads. And I, after doing this for a long time, I have literally done this to myself twice in the past four years, picking a song that I thought was beautiful, that I loved. And I'm like, yay, here we go. 
and it's the the uh, singer is beautiful here there tempo and notes and runs and and they just sound awesome and it's a beautiful piece of music but i'm like the tempo is going like this she's singing and then she slows down and then she starts singing again and then she releases and trying to find a nuance of where that tempo is okay where she says this note or sings this note is count for and and then she slows down and we're going to call this count 10 over here it's really challenging so i would definitely look at you know how how are my students or members going to be able to perform to and understand the nuances of the music and that that's a that's a big one to consider uh, <clears throat> And also, uh, in terms of uh, designing a show, understanding that, you know, not everybody has to do everything. And that is, you know, everybody wants to be, you know, throw the big toss. Everybody wants to do the cool flag trick. Uh, everybody wants to do the ensemble flag feature at the end. That doesn't have to be the case. It's traditionally kind of been how people you know, we're going to all do the flag feature at the end. Well, sometimes you have members that are really struggle with that and maybe they can't do it and that's okay. You can find another way to use people as characters, as a different focus over here, or you have a big moment and then you start the next one with the person who maybe can't hang in that particular moment. And that's, you know, you don't even have to tell them that. You just say, hey, you're not going to be in this part because I'm going to have you start the whole next section with a new flag. And then who doesn't want that? Like we're gonna get a little solo and come up with the next cute flag. Um, <clears throat> so then when I have my idea, I have my music, I have my students, you don't have to start laying stuff down the first rehearsal. Take some time. Now, if you're going from a fall to a winter in a high school, it's a little bit easier. You know the kids' skills a little bit better. If you're in an independent situation, I've had kids two months in the season, I look over in the corner and they're like throwing a rifle seven and doing a two turn under it and catch it. And I'm like, I didn't even know you could spin rifle. They're like, well, I didn't really try out one rifle. And you're like, gosh, you know, that's uh, just taking some time to get to know the members and what they can do, see how choreography looks on them, movement, flag, weapon, um, and performance also. I mean, you can have somebody who can do the most killer trick in the book, but you might not want them to have them on the 50 uh, because they're not particularly as captivating as you might want them to be in an emotional moment or something like that. So take a hot second to get to know all the levels of the members. And then uh, what I love to do is I'm listening to the music. I know that, hey, I've got five big impact points in my show. One, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, D, E, whatever. And I kind of maybe sketch out what I think that might look like. What piece of equipment are gonna be on the floor? How many people, um, what, what, what's the stage you're gonna look like? And it's, I really like to workshop those moments. Um, I might start with something that's two minutes into the song, cause it's my first really big, I don't know, ensemble impact. And I wanna see how it looks because if I start from the beginning, thinking I'm going to head to this place and I get there and it doesn't really work the idea in my head. I'm kind of stuck with where people are on the floor. So I workshop stuff and just say, we're going to try this moment in the music. I, I'm going to put the rifles back here. I'm going to put the flags and arc over here. So try it. And then, oh, I do not like that. The flags are coming up with the rifles. We need to switch it. And we need to put the rifles down and the flags up or uh, those kind of things. Try different shapes on the floor. Try different densities with different moments. And then you can say, okay, version, version six is the one we actually want to have in the show. So then we know what we're planning into. We're planning to get there. And you know what? You don't even have to take, you don't have to worry so much about, oh, is Susie Q in the exact right spot that I want her right now? Now, unless she's going to become a soloist and has to be on the corner of the floor to pick up a new piece of equipment or something, just say, guys, we are going to try some stuff and I want you guys to stand over here and spin rifle. I want you to stand over here and spin flag. And the enemy, it doesn't even matter if they're going to necessarily be a, that particular person because if you <clears throat> spend a lot of time trying to make sure everyone's in the exact spot when you're just playing around with the idea, it's just kind of wasted time because you might not be able to make those specific people get in that specific spot later anyway once you start working through the show. So workshop, 
And so you kind of have a roadmap of where you want to be in terms of destinations throughout your show. And that's how I get started. All right. Um, Leanne, uh, if you want to edit music, how do you go about getting rights permission to do that? Do you contact a publisher to request rights to edit? Um, so if you go on the WGI.org website, and go under resources, they explain the requirements for music and copyright. Um, typically with editing, you don't have to um, contact the publisher of that music in order to uh, do editing on it. This is quite a bit different than what it used to be for WGI in particular, which is what I'm referencing because a lot of circuits follow those same rules. As soon as WGI got rid of the fan network and stopped selling videos, the copyright issues kind of went away. Um, not, that, not that you still couldn't have someone say, you can't use my music, um, but there's not really a list of banned music anymore. So you, for the most part, are okay to edit your music and use it. Now you still typically, I know with WGI and even my home circuit, you have to go on and there'll be a resource where you have to list what music you're using, how many seconds of each track it is, and then you are asked to put the publisher, the artist, um, the, the comp distri distribution company, whatever, um, for each chunk of music that you're using. And they the, usually, organizations will kind of have a blanket license kind of thing um, and will let you know if you can't use a particular piece of music. Um, but kind of since that uh, WGI and even um, some circuits aren't distributing videos anymore either for the same reason. Uh, but that is something that kind of is ever evolving. So I don't have the perfect answer for that question. Just make sure that you're continuing to read and uh, stand on top of what your requirements for WGI are and what the requirements for your individual circuit are if you're not participating in WGI. <clears throat> okay. Does anyone else have any um, questions or follow-ups? So you can even unmute yourself if you want to ask real quick or type or whatever you would like to do. Did I miss anybody's? So I don't, I'm not really sure how to ask this question. Um, okay. But I know that like, just because I'm a geek and I follow everything, everything. Um, so I was like taking a look at the judging sheets um, yeah. over the over the early part of the of the spring. So I guess if you could just help kind of like clarify like certain things on a judging sheet, uh, maybe particularly like an eight class versus an open class, because I know the the weighting um, percentages are different. I think eight class is like a seventy thirty or a sixty forty weighting, and open it's fifty fifty. So if you could just kind of clarify that for me, that would be great. Yes. Um, <clears throat> So this is something that I typically will give about an hour and a half session on when we're at um, when we're at camp. And I do have a presentation that maybe Susie, we can find a way to share uh, with this video uh, uh, when we post it. I don't know if uh, we can do that, uh, but regardless, if I um, if I can get uh, maybe an email or something to send to you specifically, uh, Jalen, if you want. I can, uh, it's a, just a Google uh, Slides presentation. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can pull one of these up real quick here. So as I'm pulling this up. Um, Derek, do you wanna share your screen? Yeah, let me get this pulled up here real quick. And we can also put the link to that on the Facebook page. Jalen, did you find us on Facebook? The CGIA group? I did. Um, 
I think it's the instructor's page. Academy, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I did. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so, Susie, can I share my screen from? You should be able to. I just enabled that participants can share their screen. Let's see. Uh, I want to do this one. <laughs> I miss your text. Is that is that is that working? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Nice. Um, so this is a part of this is a presentation that I used uh, last year, um, and there are so many things that are on the sheets that I I definitely encourage each and every one of you to um, look in the look at WGI.org, that's most of the time the sheets that are being utilized are uh, for most circuits. And there's a lot of vocabulary to be sure uh, that, you know, we have to work through. And um, it does, this is exactly how I feel sometimes, vis <laughs> being visibly confused. There are, um, you're asking uh, specifically, Jalen, about uh, kind of this, what, like the back of the score sheet is that accurate okay um i'm gonna jump to that page then and this guys this just there are so many like buzzwords that are can be confusing when you're listening to a judge's tape um and so this kind of goes through a lot of those kind of buzzwords a little bit depth and range and variety and and weight space and time and all of these things so um, let's just take a look here at the uh, sheets. And uh, you can get the score sheets from uh, WGI.org. I'm an effect judge, so I'm going to talk about, I'll just kind of, this, those are the sheets that I have. Um, to specifically answer your question first though, Jalen, about A class, um, the, the balance between the uh, seventy percent uh, training and uh, thirty percent um, for the uh, repertoire. That balance is for just the two captions. We call them the downstairs captions, equipment and movement. And those judges still assign a score evenly out of a hundred. So I might give you still a six eight and a six six, let's say, at your first show. The computer then calculates that down to the 70, 30 percentage. Um, so 13, basically 13 points for uh, technique and excellence and 7% or 7 points for repertoire. Um, <clears throat> so that's not anything the judge has to do, uh, but you'll see that reflected on your score sheet. For on design analysis and the two effect judges, they are straight uh, 10 points for this and 10 points for this for a total of 20. Um, and then for uh, open class and higher, then you're looking at an even balance between the what you're doing, the repertoire, and the how well you're doing it with the um, excellence, or they call them different things in each caption. So here is what the, you know, the front of the sheet will look like. And if you, I'm pointing at the screen, like you guys can see me point at the screen, it's so funny. Uh, we're looking at who's, you know, what are they doing? And then how well are they doing it? So if you look at these major bullet points uh, for effect, this is uh, program concept and production value. Concept is just that. What's the concept? Is it working? Does it make sense? Production value is, uh, the costumes, the flags, the colors, the floor, how well does all of that work together, the makeup, the hair, all of that. Um, effects and their, and their pacing, you know, is, it, is, your, is your show going uh, the whole time? Or is there, are there rise and fall moments in your production? And that kind of works too with equipment and uh, movement as well. If people come out and they are throwing fives every, eight counts for the entire show, it's kind of like, 
okay, yippee ding, you're throwing another toss, good for you, as opposed to really building into those moments. And bam, you get the big toss at the real high point in the music. So just kind of editing and making sure that things are not, you're not looking at the same thing the whole time. We're not standing a block the whole time. We change the density. We're dense in a form like this. And then a few moments later, we've opened up the floor and we have a big arc with a soloist down here in the middle. So just creating variety in the staging. And then effect, <clears throat> down here where it says range and variety of effect, aesthetic are the aesthetics of the program, the production values, how does it look? Emotional, clearly, how does that make you feel? That's how does the music affect you? Um, is it make you happy, sad? Are the performers, you know, going to bring bringing that to life? And then intellectually, is it interesting? So whether you're looking at effect or design analysis or equipment or movement, they're all going to have a balance between what you're doing and how well you're doing it. So this is the other side. Whose performers better did these things? They, how they demonstrated excellence, which creates effect, right? Everyone nails a triple with great confidence and great faces is way more effective than that same number of people throwing a six, two of them drop it, two of them fumble it on the half, and one of them catches it solid. Which is more effective? Well, the one that was more well achieved. Um, sustain their character, delivering moments. Like we, it's, it's unfortunate, but you know, we're building to this moment and we have our big soloist, it's a big part of the music, do their big trick and they drop it. Well, they didn't deliver that particular moment in terms of effect, engaging the audience and that there's a really good mood being set. And again, I'm talking specifically for effect, but all of the general effect, but all of these captions have these same kinds of um, delineations. So when you're looking at how scores happen, you can look at this box here. If you have very insignificant differences, like guard A could win today, guard B could win tomorrow. There are such slight differences in their excellence levels. Um, so anything zero to three tenths is in that range. It could change by a performance. Um, moderate differences, four to six tenths differences, are probably not going to have big changes in like placement, let's say, from one show to the next without some something different happening within the program. Um, if you're getting significant differences, you're kind of talking about being in a different competitive neighborhood. Like for example, um, Interplay uh, was a, a finalist in world class a couple years ago in 2018. Now we uh, came in uh, 15th and throughout the course of the season we have been anywhere from like 13th to 18th or 19th and that's kind of our competitive neighborhood. We weren't in the same competitive neighborhood as Pride of Cincinnati let's say. So that's kind of what that uh, things get people kind of end up in ranges within groups that they're more likely to be competitive with. So when you look at the back of the sheets, um, whoops, let me go back here. So up at the top, on the back of the sheet where you have all of this specific information, you'll notice up at the top there are the different boxes. And this is where the scoring comes from. And you'll notice that, I mean, I, I've actually never ever seen anybody in box one or ever seen any judge give a box one score, you probably have to walk out on the floor and just stare at the crowd and do nothing if you're gonna get a box one score. But the rest of them are broken up into thirds. Most people are going to start in this third box. And within each box, it's broken up by scores of 10. And each of these little ranges, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, you're looking at how often you're achieving the expectations to get that particular score. So when you're looking at the back of the score sheet, you'll see that there are these POCs, they're points of comparison. And this is specific to effect. So these gray things in the middle are going to have different descriptors if it's equipment or movement or design analysis. So within general effect, they're talking about those things that I said on that I looked at on the front. Whoops, oh, go back, <laughs> sorry. Um, and you'll see that the program is, has good production value and concept. There's dramatic contour and pacing of effects. Everything's not the same the whole time. 
there are effective design of equipment movement and staging. And by the way, uh, within just the last couple of years, effect judges are now encouraged to comment specifically on equipment and movement skills that are being demonstrated. So that's now part of their caption as well. It's a lot of things to keep track of. But you're looking over here to the side and they give you bullet points that are more specific about each point of comparison. And you'll notice it'll say good, um, clear, identifiable, good imagination, or it might say go to completely imaginative. Um, always, you see words like this, always we yield these effects. That gets you into that fifth box, the top box, which is 90 and above. So the judge kind of looks at each of these and says, yeah, how close were they to doing this either some of the time, most of the time, or all of the time? That's where they're going to land in these thirds within each box. Well, they did these things sometimes for this particular point of comparison. So for me, they're going to be somewhere between this 30 and 39. So maybe they'll be at a 35. I'm starting to see them do it most of the time, gets me bumped into that next third between the 40 and 49. And then, wow, they're getting really close to doing this all of the time, which would bump them up to the next box. So you're kind of up here in the top third of any particular box. It's definitely subjective for judges, but these thirds help them to break it down into a little bit more of a, uh, into a little bit more objective place. But one judge might give you a 74 in your repertoire, and another one watching the exact same performance on the same day could give you a 68. And if they see that, they're gonna be thinking, gosh, I probably should take another look and see what those other people were um, seeing. So does that kind of help to give you a little bit of an idea for what's on the back of the sheet? Yeah, it does, because as a performer, I've never looked at the sheets, and I'm stepping into a new role, and I know yeah. my students always ask, you know, as we're creating the show, we know we're just doing it for fun, but, like, what is the point? What are we looking for? Mm -hmm. in science, <laughs> and I'm <laughs> so, like, new, so I don't know any of the science. I just say, this looks pretty, and it looks like that you can do it, so that's what I wanted to understand, so. There so you go, you. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, we've all been you know, Susie, me, and a lot of the people who are presenting this week, we've all been doing this for 20 some years. And we all, every year, one of the things that we always talk about is how much we learn by coming to this camp, even though we're teaching this camp, because there are things that we are all still, oh my God, how, how have I not been doing that for the past 20 years? It makes so much sense. And half the time that idea comes from campers who are there or people who come to the Color Guard Instructor Academy. So um, it's as long as you are always looking at this, like it is going to be a process for me to learn what works on the floor and what doesn't work on the floor. And there's only one way to do it, you know, figure that out. <laughs> just, yeah, just do it. Um, so there's a lot of information uh, in this uh, PowerPoint or whatever it's called, uh, Google Slides. So you'll be able to see, um, uh, all the information that's here. And um, and there are some, uh, and I'm just going forward because some things in this presentation are also talking about the design process. So we, we talked about some of those considerations, the music, the story, keeping your idea simple, and just considering compatibility with your membership. So there are a lot of, lot of things in this presentation that hopefully will give you some, uh, a, a bit more of a guide. <clears throat> okay, I think I do this. All right. Um, oh yeah, perfect. You can send me your uh, address. Anyone who, if anyone wants this, uh, are you just going to post this, Susie? Did you say along with the video? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will post the Google Doc, which if can you email it to me? Yeah. And I'll post that on the Facebook page, and this video will be up on our YouTube channel, which um, I'll post down here in just a second. And that's on our our. Did I say YouTube? 
Okay, wait a minute. The Google Doc will be in our Facebook group. It's been a long day. Yeah. And then this video will go up on our YouTube page. But I will also post where you can find our YouTube page in the Facebook group. Do you know how many times you said YouTube in the past 30 seconds? Uh, yeah. A lot. <laughs> um, uh, any other questions anyone has that, as we were talking through or can feel free to unmute yourself and ask her, ooh, ideas for recruitment and retaining members. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, there are a lot. I have, I actually have a document that I will share uh, with that as well uh, with Susie so she can post for um, recruiting. But uh, let's jump. Can I still share my screen, Susie? Am I still allowed? I jump to my Google Docs here. Just making sure I have it here somewhere. I know I do. I'll make sure I get it to, to you guys uh, posted with uh, Susie's with Susie on the uh, Facebook page there. But let's just talk through some general ideas. And this is where you can jump in uh, if you have different um, if you have different ideas for uh, that have worked in your particular groups because I know every single school or unit has different expectations and uh, different circumstances. So for recruiting, um, there are lots of things that uh, that uh, work and it just depends on your situation. I know I mentioned this earlier, but my the, the things that have worked best for the groups that I've taught and I've taught with really big groups and smaller groups as well, and I'm talking specifically for high school for at the moment, uh, is getting your, um, getting your couple of your seniors, great personality, get them all decked out, dolled up, looking beautiful or handsome, boys, girls, whoever you've got, and send them, <clears throat> of course, by coordinating this with band directors and stuff, send them down to your sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, music classes, choir classes, art classes, uh, drama club, and talking about what color guard is, what winter guard is, have some videos that you can show them um, because a lot of people are clueless about it, especially if it's a relatively new program to your school. Um, just kind of getting them to get interested. And then uh, also doing a, a fun spin dance clinic like come check out color guard do not call it color guard auditions right you want to get kids to come just try color guard for fun do not put them in a block and try to teach them to do 100 drop spins at this first introduction to color guard this first introduction to color guard is just like a color guard clinic and you get kids to come who would not normally come because they are very afraid of getting cut from anything, from trying out for a play or getting cut from a sports team. You want to take that completely away. And you do, it doesn't just have to be sixth, seventh, eighth grade. You might do a middle school one. You might do a high school one. Get kids to come. And this is how we got a lot of our band kids to start coming um, who wanted to do it, but were afraid they wouldn't be able to because their friends been doing it for five years or whatever. So get them to come to that uh, clinic and pick the cool song that's popular on the radio that hasn't been overplayed yet and do a 32 count dance routine to it that they can do. We're not going to teach them a triple pirouette, land in the splits, right? We're going to do some achievable, cool, uh, it could be fun dance, it could be lyrical and we can do arms for days and feel like we're good at color guard right away. And then um, I don't even give them a tall flag necessarily, put a swing flag in their hands, right? They you can do, and my mom is 75 and she can do this with a swing flag, right? Go up and over and turn around and, uh, 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 and do a this with your arms, right? You can almost teach it by, you know, mirroring and make them feel like, oh my God, that's not even hard. I can do color guard. 
that will get you tons of interest um, more so than just like a poster in the hallway come try out for color guard um, promotional videos and you kind of have to start this uh, if you can start it the current season and maybe use it again next year take some footage of your members uh, if, if you want to do one before this year and you didn't have time yet maybe you can get some uh, members to um, who are have already some skills spinning come and show them and, and take some video of them and show them you know we did one where we had some kids uh, showing some spinning and then we showed them like at a rehearsal seeing the circle laughing with each other and falling on the floor and making fools of themselves um, to kind of show like this is fun this is something that you're going to make great friends at and then they go from that rehearsal uh, and then all of a sudden you see them doing their makeup and doing their hair and then you see them all decked out for performance so it kind of shows like it's just, just a promo video like this is what color guard is and you know you do have to get some permissions to make sure that you can use video or pictures of, of kids. You have to check with your band director or your school on that. Um, but the same thing can be done for an independent unit. Take video of previous rehearsals, previous years, and, and you can make a video so easy. You know, now with iMovie or whatever, it, it doesn't even take that long. And pop them on YouTube and uh, get them up on Instagram and um, TikTok and whatever, and you know, use that to pull kids into your uh, program for recruitment. Um, in terms of retaining uh, members, they, I can't stress highly enough, if they feel confident and good about themselves and they have a good experience, it will not matter for most kids what their placement was or what score they got. I, I did, and Susie will tell you this too, she marched many years, I marched many years, I can't tell you one score I got. I maybe could remember a placement here or there, but the fact that you're still talking to people 30 years later who you marched with is what is going to, even though I'm talking way down the road, it's because you had fun and you got good experiences with kids. You know, they're, they're gonna remember Slurpee Day at band camp where you came in with 30 Slurpees and they all got brain freezes and laughed and act like fools uh, way more than they're going to remember what place they came in at X, Y, and Z competition in the fall. So for retaining, it is for me just making sure that they have a great experience, that you are building them up and making them feel great and confident. Now, having said that, you have to be honest with that too don't tell them they were great if they weren't because they're going to see the video and they're going to be like, Oh, we didn't look very good. And they told us they were, we were great. You know, do you have to tell them that was awful? You know, no, obviously not. But you always want to be honest and say, guys, that wasn't as good as you can do. Like you can do better. Let's work on that. And then when they are better, you get to tell them and celebrate that. And then they feel that that really does give them a sense of accomplishment when they see a video and they say, Oh yeah, we really were good. Um, so, uh, that's kind of my, uh, thing with recruitment and, um, retention is people will come back if they have a good time and they made some friends and they felt like they belonged to something, uh, bigger than themselves, which is what is, uh, something that's lacking a lot with, um, uh, people these days is they're kind of becoming, you know, feeling isolated and, and kind of just kind of living their own little life. Whereas if you can get a part of a big group, as you well know, it can uh, be really, I don't know, just make you happy and feel like you have some place to belong and they'll come back. Other thoughts, ideas on recruitment or, and or retention? Uh, yeah. The only thing I would add that kind of, uh, I call it a guard open house. That's the best thing in the world. All the, all the kids go, go crazy for it. It's, yeah, we even, we even did an online one for my university band coming up this summer. And we, we had like 60 people come in and we got all those 60 people to come back every single Wow. Week. It was great. 
That is great. Did you have them come and dance and spin or that kind we, of thing? We, or did you have them come watch your performance? So, so uh, we had a large amount of seniors leave us. So first we showed the, our last year's show. And of course we don't know what's happening with this upcoming season. So we, we showed the last, last year's show um, via Zoom. And then we said, okay, if, if you're in a space where you can dance, we're just going to teach one of our warm-ups if you want to join, which is um, one. And what we did prior to that was we were able to send out equipment um, to everyone who wanted, who was interested in joining the Guard. So they had mm -hmm. already had their equipment at home, and we had posted videos on Facebook. So mm -hmm. we had two of our instructors just on camera um, walk through um, one of our like small um, warm-up pieces, and then we put on um, Dua Lipa and said, just jam out, just just go for it, do what you want, and then we'll see if we can like kind of make something out of that from what we see over the videos at the end. Mm -hmm. And it was great. So now we have a 60 person color guard. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's that is one thing too that I forgot to mention about having like a clinic or it's even, that's even a better way to say an open house that seems like a lot, it just seems very welcoming, you know? Um, we, if you, if your band director is okay with it, which most of the time they, you know, probably would be, if you sent, if you tell kids they can take home a flag or a swing flag, they're like, really? You're going to let me take this home? Like, yeah. Like, you're going to come back. And they're like, oh yeah. And you know what I mean? It's almost like, you're almost like forcing them to come back because you're sending equipment home with them. You know what I mean? And yeah, sometimes they'll not actually come back and you'll just see the random flag laying outside the band room but um i've never really lost equipment that way to be honest with you um kids have usually sent it back or <clears throat> or at least come back one more time so that's a really great idea um i also when we did the which we'll now if we do it in the future call it open house i love that uh, yes, um, <laughs> we served snacks we served pizza and lemonade you know and a rice crispy treat so Kids are like, oh, and, and it's free. Like, you know, if it costs them nothing and it's free food, you know, even if they come for the free food, maybe they'll actually like what they're doing also. Um, so nothing talks like pizza, man. I'm so stealing the open house thing. I look, cause yeah. I always say cadet guard informational meeting. Yeah. Excusing. Yeah. <laughs> I love that calling it an open house and, and letting yeah we had we had no stuff. idea we had no idea what to call it. we were like do we call it a spin session like like we didn't want to use the oh there are kids on here so you can't see that we didn't want to use like 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 a fun time hour thing so i was like that eh, school like school house all the time it's like a back to school night so just call it an open house and it was great, it's a great yeah and then we played like trivia which was fun so cool and I like too, Derek, sending equipment home with them that night. Yeah. Yep. Don't give them a chance to second guess themselves. Like here, right. come on back. Don't send a saber. <laughs> 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 they might keep that for Halloween, but you know, you can, you can send a, a junkie rifle or, but that's a swing flag or a flag has um, been great for us. Um, Struggling to write, uh, Laura's asking, oops, I lost it. Come back. Laura, what are your tips for when struggling to write or get stuck on a certain part of the show? Um, <clears throat> well, when you've been writing for a while, uh, it's, we all know it's very easy to, and if, you, if you're just starting, it eventually turns into this. I feel like sometimes you get kind of um, stuck in doing the same choreography or the same moves all the time. Um, my number one, my number one thing when I'm like, I just did this, or I know what I'm going to do next. Like, you know, you know, you're in trouble when you're teaching your group of kids. And they're like, Oh, this is coming next. And then I write it. They're like, ha, I knew that was coming next. Well, if I get stuck writing something when I'm teaching kids, or if I'm putting it on video or just trying to get something ready for rehearsal, put the equipment in your other hand. I am a, always a right-handed like writer like my flag goes this way almost always when I start and if I put it in my other hand like how does it feel to do this on the other side I'm like oh my gosh this feels totally different well I've probably never done it that way before you're doing something on both hands um, it automatically doubles the amount of choreography that you have access to 
So that is a, that's a great one. Um, then the other thing that I like to do to kind of just set, set it free and come up with like something new that I haven't written in the show before is to put on some other piece of music, like forget the marching band track, right? And just put on your favorite singer, your favorite album and have your phone set up and just start messing around. Like how many times have you just been screwing around and be like, oh my God, that was so cool. What did I just do? Or someone's watching you spin. They're like, oh my gosh, that's cool. Do it again. And you're like, I don't even know what I was doing. I don't remember. Um, so set up your phone or computer or whatever and videotape yourself just spinning literally for the fun of spinning. And you'll be surprised with how many new things that you come up with. And not for nothing, there are a million videos out on uh, YouTube, uh, very easily accessible on our uh, Facebook page as well, where you can go and just watch phrases that other people have written. I mean, nothing's really sacred, honestly. I mean, if you're stuck, go, go watch somebody else spin and say, that's cool. I can inject that or some version of that into this choreography. Um, and th that's how, those are my number ones for getting kind of unstuck. So trying it on another hand, um, trying it um, at a different level. Like if you're standing, try it on the ground. Maybe if you're, if they're in a hold, they don't have to stand there. They can go down. Uh, they can try a mid-level on a knee. So all of those things can make things feel and look different. And then also trying the, um, trying just spinning on your own to random music and getting some cool choreography ideas. And then also uh, looking at what other people have done, different twirls from different people. We're all a community. So for the most part, we're, people are okay sharing their uh, skills with each other. And we certainly are. That's why we post them. Anything we post is yours to use without guilt or worry or anything. So. And on that note. See, we're already done. It's time for dinner. <laughs> it's crazy. It's time for dinner. Well, thank you for joining everybody. It was great to see you, meet you, and talk to you. And you are um, glad you're taking the time this week to be a part of MFA and we just are hopeful and excited that we will be able to be back together next June. This is the first time in 22 years that I haven't been at the MFA camp and I'm missing it hardcore. So oh my God. you're going to make me cry. All right. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you for saying thank you. And thank you, Derek, for sharing your vast amount of knowledge. I wish we had more hours with you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.